Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending and New York Community Bank, MNT Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Capital One Bank, the Wickhoff Group, Greenberg Traurig. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International NYC, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Foley and Lardner, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investment Developers, Herrick Feinstein, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman US Realty.com, John Katsimides, Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, MHP Real Estate Services, People's United Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Sterling Risk, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, CUNY TV Foundation, The Moynian Group, Urban American, and The friends. EB5, what is it? Is it like phone home? What, what is this type of idea of EB5, people getting a card that they could be a citizen over here? This is the newest thing in financing of commercial real estate. So today, with the help of Kate and some other people, I've assembled a group of individuals from the banker to, uh, to a, an investor to EB5 regional centers to explain to my viewers EB-5, Immigration and Commercial Real Estate. My guests, they include Mark Melchion, Administrative Vice President of m and Bank, Jeff Champin, who is the President of Pathways EB-5, Mary King, who is uh, the COO of New York City Regional uh, Center, Kate Kamakov, who is a shareholder at Greenberg Trout, and last but not least, my co-host all the time, my good friend Steve Whitkoff, who is the Chairman and CEO of the Whitkoff Group. So here's the question. What is EB-5? It's been around for years. It's become a big item recently. So Kate, tell us about what it is. It's actually the talk of every cocktail party I go to <laughs> these days. Uh, but EB-5 is an immigration program that was introduced in the early 1990s that allows investors to invest money into a U.S. business. That business has to in turn generate 10 jobs per investor and by doing so, they are able to get a green card. And it's very unique in the U.S. immigration laws because it allows them to sponsor themselves for a green card. So let's, let, let's try to understand it. There were like 10,000 visas approved or? So there's 10,000 green cards given annually in the EB-5 category. This past year for fiscal year 2014 was the first time we ever reached the quota. These are people from all over the, every country around, but they're predominantly a large number of these people are from China, correctly? Correct. 85% of all applicants are from China. And how do they find out about this? And how do they find out about what we call a regional center, which Mary and Jeff will tell me? How do they learn about this? Well, in China in particular, it's become a cottage industry. There's migration agents or brokers on the ground there and their job is to promote various immigration programs, not just the U.S., but other countries have similar programs, <coughs> and they really market and introduce projects to them. And they explain to them how to 
uh, choose a project, what criteria to look for, and how that will enable them to get their EB-5-based green now, card. Now, how much is this card going to cost? What, what does it cost the person to get an EB-5? Well, the investment, the, pr the program is a million-dollar program unless the project is in what's called a targeted employment area. At that point, it's a $500,000 investment. And then there are different fees that you pay to a regional center. You pay your lawyers. No, no, but so, so here's what I'm saying. I want to come to America. Maybe, as Jeff said, he's been in Venezuela recently, some people from the Middle East and uh, South America. They're, they're all over the, the world. They want to come here. The cost of that EB-5, if it's in a, in a work-designated area that we're talking about, is a half a million dollars. Correct. Now, they have to put that half a million dollars up front. What's the procedure on this? They put the money into a project. They, they decide what project they want to invest in. They put their money generally into an escrow account, and then um, different regional centers have different processes by which that so money he, is So here, you know, we, we gotta, we're, we're going to do this n not like inside baseball, but for yeah. the layman over there. There is a project. Let's take Steve Whitkoff, who is a very successful developer, who has utilized the EB-5 mm -hmm. mechanism to, to arrange financing. And I'm going to ask him why he wants it. And then there's Mark Melchione, who does the first mortgage on the, the property. Why have you accessed the capital markets to utilize the EB-5 as opposed to, as we were saying prior to the show, mezzanine lenders or even putting more equity? I've used the, the EB-5 program because um, our, our cost of capital for EB-5 for, we've done about 600 million, is somewhere between five and a half and six percent, six and a quarter percent. And that's just, and it comes in as mezzanine. So it's, che it's, cheaper, it's cheaper capital to us than what would be otherwise available from conventional now, sources. So you've utilized this approach and you're the bank. Why do you accept this approach? I mean, from the, the lender, you know, he's putting equity into a deal. He's building a transaction. For example, which deals are you? you 701 7th Avenue or 101 Murray or 215 Christie. So for, for my audience, 701 7th Avenue is a hotel and retail <coughs> complex in the heart of Times Square. 101 Murray is a luxury condominium right. project. You as the bank, how do you look at it? I mean, Steve Whitkoff is a successful, sure. proven person, and you've done, m and has done a number of this. How do, how do you like sure, sure. I mean, generally speaking, as a senior lender, I would say uh, every senior lender would prefer it was, it was Steve Whitkoff's equity, okay? But the reality of the market we're in and this innovative new product, I think we've taken the approach very consistently uh, at M&T that we bank sponsors and we bank the best of the best. And we understand those programs um, and the risks associated with them. And, you know, the preference is that the capital stack have EB-5 as preferred equity. Uh, that's how we see most transactions today. But six, nine months ago, it was probably more in the mezzanine part of the stack. Now, let, let, let's try to explain what Kate and Jeff do. You're the regional center. You get approved by the government to be a regional center? The New York City Regional Center and, and Jeff's Regional Centers, yes, we're approved right. by Homeland okay. Security. So how, explain to me what a regional center, what is the job of a regional center? Well, well first off, the, the total money in isn't 500, it's more like 580 when you add in your admin fees and your attorney's fees. So they're gonna pay 580, maybe 600,000 to get their, their residency. But they're going to get paid back from 500. Steve Whitkoff, 500 because that's yeah. that. Right, their, their capital account only goes to 500, but they have other expenses of 50 to 80 grand. But so the way it works is you file for a regional center to have a certain geographical scope. And that scope is defined by how you can define it and back it up by economic methodology of what you're going to do. Generally speaking, most regional centers are filed on hypotheticals because you file and say, this is what I would like to do if you approve me. And so you would send off a couple of hotels or whatever you're going to think you would do, then you're approved for a scope. And you have to promote economic growth and job creation in that geographical area. And so then CIS says to you, USCIS says, okay, uh, Northeast Regional Center, Sunshine State Regional Center, whatever you are, New York Regional Center, you now have to begin to promote this economic growth. And so now we have to go look for projects. 
And so like they look for projects and they've gotten some here in New York. We've done some in other parts of the country. And so we have to look for projects that we think, we, we talk about the word proven, that have proven developers in the space. Now, but he, there's an approach that you're regional center mm -hmm. and you've done some major projects in New York. Uh, right. Besides working with developers like Steve Whitkoff, you've done infrastructure transactions. Correct. Which are different that certain people wouldn't, they couldn't be done. Let's say Correct. traditional banks really would be uncomfortable, like the Maritime Building over mm -hmm. there, you know, or certain other. We've also you know, funded the wireless um, in the subways. We're funding that as well. Um, we we are slightly different than um, a lot of the other regional centers in that we get a first position and we go in and we are the bank. Um, we've worked with M&T as a bridge lender, but we go out and um, and are the first. We work in conjunction with a lot of um, government en entities. We work with the city, we work with the state, we've worked with Battery, um, Battery Park City Authority, Port Authority, so we've done different types of projects. Now, Kate, isn't there, now there are companies like Steve, if he really wanted to do it, the, the related companies, Extel and, and Forest City didn't do it, they, no. they utilized the regional center. There are developers who are out there and they go out and create their own business plan. Tell me a little bit about that. So there's really two models of regional centers. Uh, the first is a developer who gets a designation from the immigration agency. I could see it now, the Whitcroft Regional <laughs> Center. <laughs> and the intent is really to fund their own projects, to have this mechanism uh, to get financing, but it is an investment. It's an investment of money and it's an investment of time. It's an investment of building a team overseas that is consistently marketing and raising money. And so not everyone is willing to do it. And so the second model we commonly refer to as rent a center. So you will rent a center. Uh, sometimes you just use their license and you're still in charge of the fundraising. And in other cases, uh, the center will help you raise money. Do you let your companies be rented? Your regional centers? By the term she's using it, I guess we, in that we do, is that we are not the developer, but we run everything on the immigration and the EB-5 side ourselves. So you're always the issuer? We're always the issuer. Right. And, and see, our, our, our approach is a little different. We like to be the issuer, but we also know that, say, the related group comes to us. They've done EB-5 before. They know what they're doing. They say, hey, Jeff, we'd like to associate with, we don't like to use the word rent a center. We like to call sponsoring or, or association with us. And someone's, and they say, we want to associate with your regional center, Jeff. We've got a team. We can do it. And we'll allow them to do that. Now, here's, Steve was saying prior to the show that he has made trips to China and to other places to talk to investors. You, tell me about these trips. I mean. I, 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 I've done the presentations on five or six occasions and so explain to my me and my audience what do you mean by these presentations you go to shanghai or you you go to a, a city beijing beijing shenzhen uh, shanghai and i've been to guangzhou <laughs> so, shenzhen. So, so you've been to these beijing. cities and what tell me what happens at these meetings who are who's there are there agents who bring these people here do you advertise that steve whitkoff or the related companies are going to be making a presentation and they're going to tell you about the project yes, and the development. It is it is like a road show. And I've I'm now walking into an event space at a particular hotel generally. That's where it happens. And there's marketing materials that has been that have been prepared by the regional center. Um, uh, there uh, there is maybe a film which I think is useful where me as the developer is in that film with other people. Showing the project. Showing or, the project. Or the planned development of Correct. what you're doing. There's an offering memorandum. No different than if you were doing an offering memorandum to raise money. And that offering memorandum sets forth your background, experience, and the underlying economics of the deal. And then I will get up and actually make a presentation about my macroeconomic view about New York City, if the project is there, why I believe my break-evens are what they are, how I've decided to build with a GMP, with who the particular CM is, that I have a completion guarantee up, what my liquidity looks like, is, is, a everything. Is, it's is, a full is presentation. That traditional? Is that happen? Most cases I, 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 that the developer goes out? It happens in China most often, but I think in China it's become very institutionalized. Mm -hmm. uh, I travel a lot to other countries as well, 
Um, and I would say in the Asian countries, yes, uh, people want to meet the project, a representative of the project to get a sense of comfort. Uh, I would say in South America and the Middle East, it's a little bit different because people don't necessarily want to go to a presentation like that mm -hmm. and talk about their own financial situation mm -hmm. in a group or be seen going to a mm -hmm. presentation oh, they, like they that for their personal yeah, yeah, safety. Yeah, especially like right. in, so right, in, in South Latin America, America, America they're not gonna Latin, Latin America, they're not coming to this no. thing. No. No, it's so, one, it's one they so prefer one private meetings. Yeah. So they go for private meetings. But you should know, Michael, I made the presentation. I had staff there many times. Mm -hmm. I actually went myself because I wanted to understand the dynamics of it. Mm -hmm. That's really why I went. And it was illuminating for me. Now, uh, w recently on one of my other shows, a, an investment sales broker for a New York company told me that he was asked to go on this trip representing to talk about the marketplace in New York. Is that, does that happen frequently? It was, some, it was Jim Nelson and Massey Nackle to talk about the multifamily James Nelson, market. he went with us, yes. Okay. Um, so we do try to get guests to go to talk about different, we've had people talk about accounting, people talk about real estate, and to put more context around the offering and what it is. So this way it, it gives that investor more comfort. Uh, well, a better understanding of, of like when we did market. 701 just in line when we did with what uh, when we did 701 Murray we had Douglas Elliman brokers mm -hmm. flown into China to give people a sense of the marketplace right, to talk about how the condo sales correct. work correct when we did 701 we had CBRE brokers mm -hmm. who were representing us on the retail there <clears throat> and we had Marriott people because it's a Marriott edition hotel they're talking about what the cash flows would look like. Now, here's the question. You're the banker. <coughs> Steve Whitkoff has a 30-year track record in, in this business. He's well known. You know, as he said, 701 has uh, Marriott. You know, it's in Times Square. It's, it's, as we call, right in the, you know, in the triangle over there. How do, how do you look at certain people? I mean, and the smell test that you feel comfortable with. As a developer or as a regional center? Both as a regional center and as a uh, as a developer. So, so, you know, our analysis and our underwriting and due diligence for a sponsor such as Steve is, is really. That's why it's easy on him. I'm yeah, I mean, but but, but if it's a new, new client, so if it's a new client, you know, we do the same underwriting and due diligence f with a regional center as as we would uh, for a new client that we don't currently bank. So, uh, I don't think the analysis is any different. It's it's the entire capital stack and. And, and who the parties are. You represent both developers and regional centers. How do and investors and <laughs> investors? Okay, you have all sides of the transaction. How does an investor get comfortable with a regional center? A developer, I, I just heard because he's making a presentation. There's track record and other things. How many regional centers are there in America today? Over 600, and not all are active. The yeah. majority probably are inactive, right? right. I mean, in all yeah. reality. I think they say only about 30 to 40 percent are active. Now, somebody is going to give you this regional center, this $580,000 is yeah. what you said. That money, Steve doesn't need it right now because he's not, it, construction takes a period of time. Is there, there's an escrow? What, what's the procedure? How is this money allocated that that investor knows that they're going to get paid back, you know, and, and, you know. Different regional centers do it differently. Um, we hold our money in escrow until certain approvals by USCIS, um, and that does make them have to wait sometimes. And then we work with banks such as M&T and other banks to bridge that money to allow, to kind of smooth that out. Um, but what I would say, it's no different than if, um, I think sometimes we make it too complicated. It's just like if if he went to a, to Behringer Harbor and said, I need 20 million to Mez. It's going to be the, hopefully it's the same type of process in which he borrows the money. He's assigned standard <laughs> standard Mez docs. You know, hopefully he's going to. But here's the, the question: when when somebody normally does a financing situation, the money over here, this money has to be paid back in five years, six years. I've heard a variety it, of. Well, categories. technically, it has to be at risk, so nobody can guarantee a repayment by law. Most of the deals typically have been structured as five-year deals, with, but right now because the Chinese extensions. are going to have a longer wait in line because we've reached the quota, uh, they're pro we're probably going to see them extended to about seven or eight. 
Right, and for, and for a senior construction lender, you know, that's, that time horizon is well so, beyond so our traditional now, exit. Now, EP5s have been around, I think, from the late 80s or the early, early 90s. 90s. Early 1990. 1990. Okay, 1990. So we're talking 24 years later. What has uh, increased this preponderance that people have been reading, it, you know, in the newspapers and the publications and people like Steve Whitkoff utilizing them today? What What is... What's the reason why EB-5 has become such a important topic in real estate, immigration, and so well, on? It's, it's, I think it was, it's a couple things, but it all goes, revolves around China, right? First, it's the opening of China, right? I mean, China hasn't been open that long in all reality in terms of other countries, number one. So their economy opening and then their economy booming. So you have all these millionaires that now have money through, through real estate assets saying- But it's, uh, it's not only China. Yeah, but it's We're 85%. Talking... It's mostly China. And so, now, and so what happens is you <clears> begin <throat> to get momentum, right? And so you begin to, there's credibility now in the program. Um, for a long time, there was no, it got shut down for a while, uh, then it came back, and, and this is a legacy after it came back. And so now there's credibility, there's some, there's some historical facts on the program, and, and so other people now begin to invest in it. You have political inst you know, instability in Venezuela, Argentina, Brazil. There were booms in all those countries. And so those guys, if you're Venezuelan, you can't do any other visa if you don't have a company there except an EB-5. You can't do an E-2. So Brazil can't do an E-2. And so from an immigration standpoint, you get pushed into a corner if you're from the Latin American countries, because you, especially Venezuela and Brazil, it's, if you're rich, so, so it's an EB-5. So, so in essence, a person who's giving the half a million dollars, as you, you said to me prior to the show, even though Steve might be paying a, a interest rate on their financing of maybe five to six percent, um, which is less expensive than what we call mezzanine mm -hmm. or preferred equity financing, that investor is only getting a much lower return because they really want the card. The visa is more important and the repayment is important but as opposed to the interest component, that's not that important to them. I think that's right, Michael. And one thing real quick, you know, you said you do mostly first liens. Mm -hmm. The reality is the majority of projects are gonna be MES because that's where the sweet spot is of EB-5. And the reason isn't because first liens aren't good, but it's job creation. And so, since, remember, we always have to remember it's a job creation program. And so whenever you're looking at how much money can you raise, it boils back down to how many jobs you create. Now, but, and you know, we were talking, Steve brought it up before about the Nassau Coliseum and you were, you were involved with the Barclays Center. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are transactions which are very difficult for a lender. Mm -hmm. to, you know, it's a spec. Right. It's a speculative <laughs> situation uh, that people, uh, you know, right now I, I know they're talking about the new peer over here find they're getting $130 million from the Diller family and from Furstenberg, but there, there's probably more of a need, and that probably could be an EB-5 deal because as a banker, you're not right. going to take that type of risk. Well, it's also one of our projects with City Point in downtown Brooklyn. And we went out, as you said, it was spec. They didn't have any leases signed. They weren't, and, and, and if they wanted to do traditional financing, they would have had to cobble together and syndicate a number of different banks. With EB-5, they were able to go out and do a, a large raise and have it all with one lender, which has made it easier, get built, and then when, as they get their, the, the project moving, they're able to do better deals with the, with the leases and with their tenants. Now, for, uh, I, I'm familiar with City Point. What type of pricing does a, a borrower like that pay for the first mortgage? Because it's different than the mezzanine. Is it a 5% rate or is it? Our, our rates are yeah, around 45 to 5% when we're in a first position. And there's fees also. They're origination fees, origination. but every, all of the, the road shows, all of that, that's on us. All of the immigration part, we pay for all of that. The, the challenge is, though, I would say this, is that as, as, as EB-5 market continue, continues to change, you're probably going to see less spec deals. We, we matter of fact, had a, had a spec deal out in Texas that was um, very large, but it was a one of a kind to U.S. industry. We went to the five largest brokers and they said, we don't, want to, we don't want to do it because we've got so many projects that are in our wheelhouse, mixed use, hotels. Um, why do we want to go and do something that, that we don't know? We have to, and they said, we're not going to do it. So my question or big picture question is, I think in the, in the, in the short term, we're going to start to see the market change in which it's not, they're not going to entertain a spec deal. I think it depends on, on what it is. As you said, it, it's a mixed use and residential project, which is what we, which is what we did. Got it. So, you know, with job creation, what type of jobs are supposed to be created? 
I can understand it's 701 7th Avenue. There's a magnitude of jobs that are going to be created. First of all, there are construction jobs that are being created. And second of all, there are hotel jobs being created because these are, there's going to be a new industry. There's going to be a 400-room luxury edition hotel over there. And then there's going to be retail. So you, know, you have retail jobs, and I see all those jobs. What other jobs are, are qualified for creation? So the regional center program uses a concept of indirect jobs. And indirect jobs are based either on expenditures or in some cases on revenues. And I think the two biggest uh, spots are construction. And that's why about 80% of all UB5 deals tend to be real estate and operations. And because it's operations, it's very flexible. So UB5 can be used in a hotel. It could be used in an assisted living facility. It could be used in an office building or retail. Uh, so those are really right. principally the types and of jobs. At the end of the day, it's, it's a, you know, a lot of the, it's an, econ it's an econometric formula, whether it's RIMS2, which is published by the BEA, or if it's Implan, or Redine, um, or, 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 re or Ready, Rem, Rem, Remy. Remy. We were well, talking inside baseball. Let's speak. No, I know, <laughs> but, but here's Economic the point. Models. It's just a formula. All you do is you take, for REMS 2 is really easy. As long as you have done multiplication, it's easy. You take how much money you spend on hard cost of construction, multiply by a multiplier, which REMS 2 BEA gives you. So it might be for every million dollars spent, you create five indirect and induced jobs. You, as long as you spent the money, you created the jobs. Will the government create, increase the number in the future of this because it's first of all it's helping the economy it's creating creating jobs it's also mm -hmm. bringing money into the country uh you know th there's a lot of good positives do you see that increase i think that's the million dollar question the eb5 regional center program is a pilot program it's set to expire september 30th 2015 and we have seen a number of bills that not only want to reauthorize it permanently but increase mm -hmm. that quota right increase it up to 20,000, take dependents out of that number. So I think that 2015 is going to be a year of changes in EB-5. So, you know, 30 minutes to talk about EB-5. I, I think my viewers and I self have got a better understanding over there and fortunately bringing all the elements of being a banker, a borrower, a, a developer, and regional center and a council to this, and immigration has really been valuable. So hopefully later on in the season we'll have a return to give a little primer on this. And I'd like to thank Mark, Jeff, Mary, Kate, and Steve, and I'll see you next week.